Everybody, it's eight o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, it really is an absolute pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Andy B. Winner. Uh, Andy has made a tremendous number of contributions to the field of biomechanics. He's probably best known for his work on scaling of limb posture and also at sort of elucidating fundamental properties of muscle and neural control through uh, innovative in vivo research techniques. Uh, but I think far beyond his contributions to science, Andy has personally mentored a number of people in this room and many of the people working in biomechanics today or comparative biomechanics today and uh, really grateful for that. So without any more ado, Andy. Okay, I guess I'm getting mic'd up as well, but well, thank you, Craig, and thanks for coming. I was really a, a privilege and an honor to come here and speak to you. Um, Craig probably kept that short because he knows that I tend to run long, so I've got to keep my uh, time so we uh, have a chance to uh, ask questions at the end. So uh, what I'd like to talk to you today is it's really, it is, you know, nice to be able to talk to people that are, um, we're, um, collaborators, past collaborators of mine. I'm going to be covering some of their work. Uh, this is sort of a review of some of the, the things that I've worked on over the years. Um, and I'm going to sort of show some how comparative biomechanics can be related to developing insights for human biomechanics, which is one of the main themes of this uh, meeting, as well as uh, biorobotic design. So I'll see if this advances. Oh. And so, you, and you can see on the lead slide, we've got the iconic range of animals that we've uh, been studying, so I will be going. So one of the things I wanted to emphasize was the importance of taking an integrative approach, and I think that's part of the theme of this, the subsequent sessions is that it's compared to biomechanics across organizational scales, that to really understand ultimately the control of movement and the biomechanics of movement, which is about managing whole body dynamics and center of mass energy state, uh, you have to understand how, if it's legged low motion, um, how the underlying limb dynamics associated with joint moment and kinematics um, play into controlling body motion. And underlying that is the muscle tendon dynamics. Um, and if you're interested in control, it's the neuromuscular, neuromechanical dynamics of controlling muscle tendon units uh, to produce the forces and do the work that's necessary to move the body. And intrinsic to those, uh, uh, dynamics are the force length and force velocity properties of muscles, which can be studied by ergometry. So our lab tries to take approaches to study these different levels of organization and aspects of uh, locomotor behavior. And we are also interested in increasingly in um, unsteady uh, locomotion compared to steady locomotion because unsteady movements are more often the case what we use uh, when we move around in the natural environment. So I want to start uh, by asking you know, answering the question, why study comparative animal biomechanics? And I have probably six uh, reasons listed for why I think it's important to take a comparative approach, especially given that there's the large emphasis in biomechanics, especially at a meeting like this, is on human biomechanics. Um, one is I think they provide key insight into muscle tendon function. Um, the, relevant, the importance of elastic energy savings came out of studies of kangaroos and wallabies, uh, but also of horses and humans. Um, the effect of tendon compliance on uh, interacting with muscle contractile function, um, protecting muscles uh, from being injured, so the work of Tom Roberts and Manny Azizi has shown important for avoiding injury and rupturing muscles in eccentric contractions. And then neuromechanics, the integration of nervous system function and control of muscle function, the motor output side, um, and the importance of intrinsic force length and force velocity properties that can reinforce what, what is considered to be more important in terms of the control of movement is the neuromuscular uh, reflexes uh, feeding back into the spinal cord. Um, key insights into skeletal and soft tissue mechanics emerge from comparing um, animal biomechanics because we can do experiments on animals, measure things on animals that you can't measure in humans. Bone remodeling, bone modeling during growth, important in responses to growth activity and physical activity in general. Uh, cartilage and tendon properties. Taya Finney is talking about the importance of tendon loading and tendon properties that are associated with physical activity and aging in just another room. But these come out of many uh, comparative studies. General principles of comparative, um, of terrestrial locomotion emerge from comparative biomechanics. So our understanding of center of mass mechanics and pen, uh, pendular exchange of kinetic and tensional energy to minimize the actuation requirements of 
uh, walking and the uh, passive dynamic walkers that were sort of built based on that principle of design emerged from comparing different animals in the way they walk, including humans. And the spring mass model for running and hopping or the spring loaded inverted pendulum um, that actually also applies to walking came out of comparative studies of animal locomotion. Uh, and more recently, the importance of uh, minimizing collisions or how collision um, of the limbs with the ground interact to influence the mechanical requirements of movement has come out of comparative studies. It also provides, by studying these animals across the range of uh, motor behaviors, it provides perspective on human training for athletic performance as well as rehabilitation of movement disorders. And that's been one of the areas that I've been interested in applying sort of basic biomechanics to its relevance for understanding how to interact with training uh, protocols and rehabilitation for um, human movement. And finally, uh, and we'll hear talks later in sessions about the importance of using animal studies for uh, s developing both biorobotic and prosthetics by inspired design. Um, and a series of robots that have come out of that, one that I was associated working with Big Dog, I'll talk briefly about, uh, but there's more recently at this meeting, there's quite a few uh, talks and there will be one later by Greg Swicky on exoskeletal design of exoskeletal assistive devices for which are important for both rehabilitation as well as augmented uh, performance. And finally, uh, most recently our work has been using in vivo me measures of comparative uh, methods on animals in the muscles of animals to sort of develop data sets as a platform being able to test and validate uh, muscle models that are very broadly used in the uh, open sim framework for human biomechanics, but often those models historically haven't really been validated, so the properties incorporated in those models um, really can't be tested in terms of what their relevance is to how accurate the model can predict what actually the muscle tendon unit does in associated with a given uh, movement pattern. In this, the upcoming talks following mine, uh, at least three of these areas where I've got the check marks are going to be addressed in the talks that, uh, by the speakers in the next two sessions. So I just want to uh, show the relevance of their work relative to these topics. So the outline of my talk is I'll start off with a broad comparison of in vivo muscle function measurements, um, which is what got me started in this area, um, comparing briefly bird flight and the role of muscles. I don't think there's been a talk on birds flying uh, in this, in this uh, meeting, so I'll have one shout out to uh, the, the relevance of being able to study the function of muscles in flight relative to wallaby hopping. And then I'll talk about muscle tendon function in relation to muscle tendon architecture and its relevance to concepts of uh, force economy uh, and elastic energy recovery relative to muscle work, where we more traditionally think about muscle function in terms of modulating uh, work output. Um, I'll talk about the in vivo dynamics of muscle underlying stability responses in guinea fowl, because Monica is one of the people who invited me, and this was work that I've, over the years, um, had the privilege of uh, mentoring and collaborating with her on that work, when a lot of interesting results can have come out of that. Um, so somehow our work has briefly had relevance to the design of Big Dog as a, as a legged robot. Uh, and then finally, uh, if given time, testing and validating heel type muscle models. Okay, so. Starting off, I want to first give a shout out. Uh, the ASB has the Borelli Award for Alfonso Borelli, um, and Irene Davis uh, was the award winner this year. But one of my other uh, shout out, uh, historical uh, uh, stars in this field is Etienne Maré, uh, who really was a comparative biomechanist. So here he has a, I'm not sure whether this is him or a subject of his, but he's, this is back in the days before electricity. So he has mechanical devices to look at foot contact times relative to head motion while he's handling. Uh, the recording equipment um, in his, his hand, but he also studied bird flight. So for a long time, there's been this interest in how uh, the mechanics of movement relates to terrestrial and, and aerial locomotion. Uh, so the traditional properties of muscle, the classic properties are force velocity and force length properties, but these are um, really quasi-static properties and we have to ask, animals are dynamic in the way they move, humans as well, we have to really ask how do these quasi-static properties relate to the time varying forces uh, and length changes that muscles undergo. And um, you know, what will emerge from this, these force length and force velocity properties, is that they can provide e intrinsic stabilizing uh, responses of muscles to perturbation, such as a rapid stretch of the MTU that could change the velocity and the length of the, of the fibers that allows them to respond rapidly to um, minimize the disturbance of that perturbation, and Jerry Loeb liked to coin this uh, intrinsic response of preflex before the actual afferent reflexive pathway through the spinal cord can modulate the motor output. So 
Um, because I'm going to be talking about muscle tendon length function in two different contexts, if we take the force velocity curve of muscle, which we most, uh, most of us should be familiar with, um, we know that the velocity of shortening influences the force that a muscle can develop. We, we can transform that in terms of the, what we might expect to be the time varying force and length properties of muscles below. And so for concentric shortening contractions where we might want to be maximizing work or power output, um, the muscles are going to show counterclockwise changes in length relative to force, so the area within that work loop is the positive work that's done by the muscle over its contraction cycle as it contracts, develops force, shortens, and then relaxes again. On the other hand, muscles might operate isometrically with minimal length change, but they can develop much higher forces and they're going to operate more spring-like. Um, and so th under those conditions, we'll see that muscles might be operating this way during steady running or hopping in comparison to doing positive work for jumping, accelerating, cycling, uh, or animals that fly and swim. And then finally, on the eccentric side of the force length, force velocity curve, muscles are going to go through clockwise uh, uh, changes in f uh, force relative to length. That's on the lower left. Um, but they can develop very rat high forces. And so one of the advantages of eccentric contraction and a stretch shortened uh, contraction cycle is the muscle can develop high forces and at a relatively low cost, and they can actually also um, absorb energy effectively as a, as a dampener for, uh, for decelerating the body. So let's briefly talk about uh, muscle function in flight. So um, the, the one of the, the, the nice things about this approach is we can study one of the, uh, a very large muscle in a bird, the pectoralis. Um, and so one is shown here. And the, this is a cockatiel showing the pectoralis in red in this location. And we can use one of the techniques we use is sonar micrometry to measure in vivo changes in fascicle length. And some of the sonar micrometry crystals are shown on the left there. Um, and then we implant those into the pectoralis along with EMG. And in these studies, we use a strain gauge mounted on the delta pectoral crest of the humerus um, to record the uh, strain of the bone. We can calibrate that against muscle force. And so a tetanic contraction above um, to te tetanize the pectoralis, you see the, force, out the uh, force output of the muscle measured with a force transducer against the strain, and we can get a good calibration of time varying uh, force from the bone strain measurements. And then we take those measurements, and we have the fun then of putting a bird, training a bird to fly in a wind tunnel. So this is a cockatiel flying in our wind tunnel. Um, and uh, we can measure then the length changes of the fascicle shown in red, the pectoralis, um, while it's over time varying patterns of, of uh, force development during uh, flight and the gray areas during the downstroke when the muscle's active to pull the wing down and generate the lift for flight. And you can see that when the muscle's generating force, that um, blue curve below, um, it's doing that when the muscle is shortening. The muscle shortens over a very large strain, so about 35%, which at the time we measured those were really substantial. I don't think anybody previously thought the skeletal muscle would uh, undergo those such large strains in doing uh, work. Um, but you can see that the muscle is actually activated um, in an isometric or even in some cases we've found eccentrically because it's turned on at the end of the upstroke when the muscle is undergoing its final lengthening phase. So it can, and on the right hand side then is shown uh, the work loop that results from that force length pattern. So the muscle develops force. The activation is there is shown in green, a little bit highlighted there. So the muscle can develop force rapidly to a high level. So then when it shortens, the force is high and the work is uh, a substantial amount of work is done over the cycle. We can measure that work in the area contained within the loop. And that's the cycle work, the work per unit contraction cycle. And if we then know, multiply that times the wing beat frequency, we can actually uh, study the mechanical power requirements of flight across a range of flight speeds by flying the bird, sort of like the, air, the wind tunnel provides like a treadmill for the, us to be able to study slow flight relative to faster flight. And we've done this, this uh, shows three different species for which we made these measurements, um, which these were the first measurements that actually confirmed previously the, the understanding the power requirements of flight were largely the realm of quasi-steady aerodynamic theory, which argued that there would be a U-shaped power curve. At least for two of the species we see, in fact, that's borne out, that flying slow uh, requires a lot of power from the muscle to overcome the high induced power flight costs. But then there's a minimum power speed at an intermediate speed. And then due to the increases in parasite and profile drag as the bird flies faster, 
the power requirements of the muscle go back up again. And interestingly, the Magpie, we never got quite that, either they didn't fly fast enough in our wind tunnel, we never got to the higher flight speeds that they could incur those higher power requirements. But one of the exciting things about this work is we can see how the muscle's designed to, in its contraction and the architecture to be able to produce these very high contractile strains, generate force to maximize work output, which is the uh, nece necessary function of the muscle in a, in a motor behavior such as this. And we can actually, because the muscle, the two pectoralis muscles represent about 20% of the bird's uh, body mass, they represent the large fraction of the power generating actuation of flight, we can really characterize whole body performance from measurements in a single muscle, which is difficult in legged animals that have many muscles crossing different joints where you, you really can't sample all the muscles at one time, and that's why modeling becomes important. On the other hand, we can look at uh, legged locomotion, in this case, hopping locomotion, uh, because we were interested in the role of elastic energy recovery. So we went to Australia, worked on wallabies. This is a red kangaroo, the Alex, the Neil Alexander red kangaroo uh, that everyone likes to show. We didn't have a good video of, the, of our tamar wallabies. In this case, we measure forces with tendon buckles in combination with sonar micrometry. And what you're seeing are the forces measured relative to activation of the uh, plantaris muscle, which is actually quite large in, a, uh, in a, um, a, a wallaby as well as kangaroos, the gastrocnemius, and then a flexor longus uh, tendon, showing the forces during uh, hopping at four and a half meters per second. And when we combine those force measurements with our sonar micrometry measurements, which we carried out in a subsequent study, we can see in so my, the sonar micrometry shows the fascicle length changes in red below the forces being developed in both the plantaris and gastrocnemius. You can see that the muscles develop uh, what turn out to be very high forces. Um, I'm not showing you the stresses, but they are actually really substantially high forces, um, but undergo very little length changes. These are length changes on the order of about a millimeter uh, contractile uh, pattern with resulting strains of the muscle fibers of on the order of uh, one to three or four percent. So really tiny strains, nearly isometric contractions. The plantaris work loop is very spring-like. There's very little area within that, so it doesn't really do any work. It basically develops force at a high level and then uh, relaxes. The gastrocnemius shortens a little bit, taking up some of the, pulling against the uh, tendon to stretch it, but then it contracts and the, um, most of the contraction cycle is isometric. And so these two muscle tendon units, in a, uh, that, um, if we think about powering or supporting the locomotion of a wallaby, really don't power the movement. They basically uh, effectively uh, re re uh, store and return elastic energy for the tendons um, so that the, these muscle tendon units operate like springs and that supports the overall spring-like function of the limb consistent with the spring mass um, mechanics of hopping and running. So these are muscles that are important for elastic energy savings but not for uh, producing work. And when we, this is not the only uh, example of this, Tom Roberts, and probably the most highly cited paper for making these kinds of measurements in turkeys, found that turkeys, when they run on the level, similarly operate with very little strain and isometric behavior. However, when turkeys uh, run up an incline, the muscles undergo greater shortening uh, during force developments. They can contribute to the work requirements of raising the center of mass while as animals running incline. Uh, in measurements I did with Craig, with hopping wallabies on inclined slopes, I'm not showing the data, but we actually found no change. They, they actually don't change their role. They continue to function as simply generating force economically and uh, storing energy in the tendon. And, and that in increased work for incline hopping, wallabies don't actually like to, they don't like to go downhill, that's for sure, but they don't, the incline, uh, incline hopping is achieved from proximal muscles rather than the distal muscles. And if we take our measurements elastic energy stories from these direct force measurements of the muscle tendon units, we can calculate with some reasonable assumptions about the material property characteristics of the tendons. We can actually quantify the elastic energies that's stored um, during hopping at different speeds in these wallabies. And if we assume a freak, uh, an efficiency for muscle work of about 25% and the energy savings that comes from storing and returning energy elastically rather than having to do it uh, by producing, generating work by the muscles, at six meters per second we calculated that that matches the twofold energy savings that kangaroos and wallabies achieve relative to what would be expected by a typical mammal that's running at that speed. So what's shown above is the oxygen consumption energy expenditure rate of what would be predicted for a typical mammal from the multitude of um, energetic studies that have been done on running animals compared to the remarkable pattern that wallabies and kangaroos show where they can increase their hopping speed without increasing the rate of energy use. 
And the work output of the muscles simply doesn't go up. It's preciously little across the whole range of hopping speeds that we recorded. So these, uh, re these the role of elastic energy recovery, uh, minimal uh, uh, muscle fiber strain for, uh, and we'll see maximizing the economy of force generation is not uh, specific to uh, wallabies and kangaroos. It's a very general feature of legged locomotion. And as Alan Wilson sh uh, talked about early in the, in the meeting, horses have, are replete with these muscle tendon units that have very short fibered pinnate muscles with very long tendons that can effectively operate as springs to store and recover energy. Humans, the classic paper by uh, Kerr and Alexander, measuring the energy recovery in the Achilles tendon and the plantar flash and ligaments. Uh, showed that you could get about 50% of the uh, return of energy to reduce the amount of mechanical work requirements of human running. And I have to give a shout out to Craig because it's not all, not all wallabies are really good at storing and recovering energy. When we went back to Australia uh, later, we looked at another species of wallaby, a rock wallaby. Um, and these are animals that actually live in very uneven terrain. Uh, so to do this, Craig uh, created Mount McGowan. He likes to climb mountains, but in this case, he, created, he, he built his own mountain of three and a half meters high. But he actually um, worked with these wallabies, and I'll just play the video, because it was when he sent this back to me, it was a remarkable video, because it was just really kind of fun to see this. That they actually do hop and land on the force plates. We thought, will they ever land on a force plate? Because a lot of animals are really good at avoiding landing on force plates. These guys target landing sites because they live in very rocky terrain, uneven terrain, and so they're actually, what they look for when they land is actually a very uh, good landing site. So the force plates provided that for looking at takeoff mechanics or landing mechanics. Um, and so th we found really this sort of hopping, saltatory kind of uh, locomotor behavior is actually really good for uneven terrain negotiation rather than simply economical hopping over like the, uh, a grassland plain as we might think for a kangaroo or a tamar wallaby. So what I want to do now is focus on the role of architecture because I think uh, many of you in the room will probably appreciate this, but I think some of the important principles that emerge from the role of tendon architect, muscle tendon architecture relative to the function of muscles for generating work versus storing and recovering energy and operating economically. So the classic paradigm is parallel fibered, long fibered muscles versus pinnate short fibered muscles. The pinnate muscles often ha are connecting to the skeleton to transmit force through longer tendons. They have different force generating capabilities, whereas force generation capability is high for pinnate muscles. Um, the position control, control of position, especially with a series of elastic stretch, is relatively low, and there's actually a really interesting um, uh, poster by Emily Abbott that actually showed that longer uh, compliant tendons actually may also reduce the ability of spindle organs to respond appropriately to per length changes or velocity changes of the muscle tendon unit. Um, but they're actually very good for elastic energy recovery. Um, but we can all, and they also are really good for minimizing the cost of generating force. And the longer and thinner the tendon, while the position control goes down, the elastic energy savings can go up and the cost of generating force um, will be benefited. So if we look at the cost of force generation, why is architecture critically important to the cost of energy consumed to generate a given amount of force? Well, that's because the volume of muscle that's active is very dependent on the architecture of the muscle. And this is resulted from work that Tom Roberts originally did in comparing bipeds from versus a quadruped, uh, but we then subsequently looked at this and, and, and compared this more broadly. This is a general principle, we think, in which long fibered muscles such as hamstring muscles in humans or other animals um, cost much more energy to generate a given amount of force. So the force is proportional to the active cross-sectional area of the muscle, the PCSA. Um, what's shown in this little representative schematic is one third of the muscle being recruited, um, but for that um, third of the muscle being recruited, if the fibers are three times as long, that's gonna involve three times the volume of active muscle, more ATP be being consumed. So the cost of force generation goes up substantially the longer fiber the muscle is. So pinnate muscles provide an architectural design that minimizes the energy cost of locomotion. So it's not all about doing work, but it's also uh, minimizing the work requirement, the energy uh, used in the, in the context of doing work or moving the body. So while work per kilogram is uniform for muscles in general, uh, the cost per kilogram is not, and that's important to re remember. 
Okay, so we've now, um, I haven't shown you all the various studies that I and others have done, but we've now been able to sample muscle function across a range of mo motor behaviors and different species and muscles, and I think a pattern is emerging so we can sort of create this plot um, in which the muscle tendon unit function in terms of force versus energy economy uh, shifts whether the muscle acts as an actuator on the left um, in which the muscle has to undergo relatively high shortening strains to do work, um, and this would be facilitated by a parallel, more parallel, longer fibered architecture, and the birds sort of are the high performers in this category, generating high work outputs, uh, to operating as springs in the lower left, which the kangaroos and wallabies and horses have muscle tendon architectures that are uh, pinnate, long tendons, undergo relatively small um, fascicle or fiber strains, and so they provide high energy economy and operate more like springs. So let's move on to um, muscle dynamics in relation to the neuromechanics control of movement, especially under un unsteady conditions. And this is work that Monica started with me for a PhD thesis, but she's continuing it. And, um, this was a really kind of fun uh, project in which we trained guinea fowl to run down a runway, which isn't too hard to do because they're really good running animals. We had to come up with a way to perturb them, and so we came up with a very low-tech way, which is to put a sheet of tissue paper across the runway surface with a force paint below, uh, inducing the bird to run down the runway, and unexpectedly it contacts the tissue paper and it breaks through. And she found that there were some initial critical conditions to how the animals stabilize when they run uh, down the runway. So here's in slow motion the guinea fowl running, breaking through the tissue paper, landing on the force plate, and then uh, managing to move along. And I think somebody was asking me, what, what does it take to uh, destabilize a guinea fowl and have it fall down? Well, I don't really know the answer to that, what the exact extreme requirement would be for uh, instability, but I think out of something like 75 or 80 trials, we, um, and what's that? We had one fall, yeah. Okay, and I have five minutes left to finish. All right, so quickly, we had three hypotheses for how they'd stabilize. One, they just operate like the Ferris and Farley study of humans. They simply maintain similar center of mass mechanics, or they could speed up by converting potential to kinetic energy, or they could absorb that uh, energy. And we found that, in fact, two-thirds of the time they sped up to convert it to kinetic energy, and a third of the time they simply absorbed that energy. And since I need to move along, uh, we also could do the muscle tendon length dynamics. Um, and uh, what we found when they do the um, running over an obstacle, we found that the muscles sh shorten, change their force velocity characteristics. So they shorten more, a higher increase in velocity, and that results in a force depression. And you can see that the force relative to control locomotion is substantially depressed, uh, which would be appropriate given the position of the foot there. There's no reason to produce a lot of force. We then, those are hard experiments, so we actually moved to obstacle treadmill studies where we, instead of falling into a hole, the birds had to negotiate obstacles, and that's shown above uh, in cross section, about a five millimeter obstacle they had to encounter. So here's the, the guinea fowl now running on an obstacle treadmill. Now in this case, the muscle, they have to negotiate the obstacles, so they step up in the obstacle, the muscle doesn't shorten as much, and the velocity of shortening is reduced, and so that actually enhances the force output of the muscle as it's being activated. It's probably reinforced by reflexes, um, and that's something that we're interested in studying. So we've moved from these intact uh, studies of the um, guinea fowl algae to doing um, self reinnervation re re studies where we've tr uh, transected the nerve to the algae of both limbs, let the, uh, the nerve grow back and re the muscle, the regains EMG function. And it's been shown that this uh, removes the proprioceptive innervation through the spindle organs of the muscle. Um, and does this, with the question is, can the animals run and stabilize when they're uh, doing this, this is a guinea fowl running after it's recovered its uh, motor capability, and it's quite good at running on level ground, and we found, and I'm not going to show you the data, that it's actually able to also able to negotiate these obstacles reasonably well. So let me quickly just give a, uh, point out the relevance to biorobotics. So we collaborated with Boston Dynamics on this. Um, they were building their, their first big dog robot, you can see up in the upper left, actually had two forelimbs with two elbows pointing backward. We said we didn't think that was a good design. David Lee was the postdoc on the project with me. He had previously shown that by having knees pointing forwards and elbows pointing backwards in a quadruped, biases the ground reaction forces to be decelerating on the uh, forelimbs and propulsive on the hind limbs, and that 
pit, that orients the ground reaction forces closer to the center of mass reducing pitch, and that helped improve the stability of Big Dog. So here's Big Dog 2 with the limbs in the right positions, and it was much more stable, able to move over this rocky terrain, but I'm gonna turn on the sound, if I've got it here. And you can see, it was a stable robot, but it wasn't a very quiet robot. That's okay, I'm gonna turn it off. I think everybody can hear that. Okay. So it also got us to do really fun experiments, getting goats to climb up, uh, sort of recurring theme here, building our own little rock uh, surface, uh, uh, getting them to cl climb up and see how they stabilize going over uneven terrain. So we end up with various uh, bio-inspired design requirements for Big Dog that helped um, the robot um, based on our studies, and some of these were implemented, but some of them weren't because they cost energy for the robot. So just to finish up in the last two minutes, we've now been using our ability to measure, make measurements of in vivo force behavior to try to test and validate hill type muscle models, and this is work that I've been doing in collaboration with James Wakeling at Simon Fraser. We started out uh, doing this with goat muscles, uh, and with Sabrina Lee, uh, as a postdoc at the time, uh, our models, we, one of the questions was a two element model with fast and slow units, would it perform better than a one element model? We found that it does, especially at higher speeds. So it's shown on the left are the modeling results compared to the in, in vivo forces measured during galloping and then above uh, trotting and walking. And it does so for faster movements, but there are still fairly substantial uh, root mean square errors to the models for time varying force. Uh, for both the LG and the MG. So moving ahead, we've done this for cycling uh, with Taylor Dick, but we've now been moving towards a rat muscle skeletal model approach. So with uh, Carolyn Eng spearheading the effort, we've been making these measurements in rats where we can focus on the rat MG and using a leaf spring transducer, get the same force length measurements and activation characteristics in vivo across a range of gait and grade, uh, grade conditions. And then with actually Natalie Holt also helping us, this is a very long project and it's taken a long while to get the, uh, all the data analyzed. And then Chris Tice is a postdoc at the lab and then with collaboration with Nikolai Cano, we've actually measured then the force length properties and force velocity properties of both the distal and proximal fibers and the whole muscle belly, as well as muscle tendon uh, architectural gearing. Um, to compare and incorporating those uh, force length, force velocity and architectural gear properties. Uh, Chris Tice, working with James, was able to develop uh, models. These are just one element models that pre predict remarkably accurately, much more better, much better than we were able to achieve for the goat and the human cycling data. Uh, Fits to had our root mean squares above or matching the in situ uh, uh, work loop study uh, stimulation of the muscle undergoing length changes and activations characteristic of uphill galloping and below is matched to the in vivo measurements of tr uh, level trotting that are really remarkably improved over what we got before. So um, I'm not gonna summarize again, but basically I've covered these three areas and I think these, we, I hope I've convinced you that these are, uh, from our studies, are areas that we can sort of uh, uh, make relevant uh, findings that are gonna address all of these important topics. And so with that, I'll take questions. Uh, this is a somewhat dated slide, uh, but it includes Monica and Craig. Uh, we all looked a little bit younger and a little bit better then, I think. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we do indeed have time for questions. So Remarkable uh, thing, yeah. We have a microphone here up front, and this one can go around as well. If you would introduce yourself when you ask your question, that'd be great. We have about 15 minutes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Greg Swicky from Georgia Tech. Um, you talked about robots and animals. What about putting those two together? I work on wearable robots, and I'm interested to know what you think the big questions that my lab should be working on. Are. <laughs> well, uh, since I know I, I am a fan of your work and I know what you're doing, it's, I think one of the uh, new directions that you and Chris Richards are taking is actually trying to integrate the animal uh, with actual muscles to actuate robotic as a robotic platform to test the way in which the control of the muscle function can uh, provide uh, good actuation or how you develop an exoskeletal device to improve that performance. Uh, Connor Walsh, uh, wears uh, wearable exoskeletal suits. We talked about one of the areas might be that you, and I think Jonas Rubinson's working on this as well, is you can build an exoskeleton um, with an animal model. You can actually measure the forces that the animal produces 
and see how your device actually influences and interacts with those muscle forces, which is difficult. You have to otherwise, in humans, you have to model what the, the muscle's doing. You can maybe use ultrasound imaging, as I think you're doing as well. Uh, so the more you can probe the way the muscle's contracting and functioning in the context of how your prosthetic or your exoskeleton is actually uh, being tuned in terms of its design, and does it actually do what you think it's going to be doing, and how does it influence the way the muscle functions. I think that's a critically important uh, approach to take. One follow-up. Do you yeah. think um, animals would tolerate wearing exos over long time periods? So this is one question that we're having trouble solving. Well, In your experience, how long would an animal wear something that I, I don't. I, don't I have never had animals wear suits. Uh, we've, <laughs> we've wrapped them with managing tape and had them wear that for a while. Uh, we, we, I mean, there was the possibility of trying to build a, a wearable exoskeleton for a goat when we were doing the goat studies, but I didn't have a graduate student, nor did uh, Connor have a graduate student that was going to take on the time invested to build the suit. He was building suits for human lower extremities, not for goats. So it's really, and I think that's what you're doing with the guinea fowl, right, with Jonas, is building yeah. a suit, will the guinea fowl work, and Suzanne? Sort of, kind of. Some of them like it. Yeah. Some of them really don't, so. Right. Yeah. All right. Good morning, Chris from the University of Houston. It's amazing to see all the, the work you've done on different animals, and one of the, the slides that you show was the, the change in VO2 across speed in the, the kangaroo. And it's always been counterintuitive to me to, to see that the VO2 didn't change. Um, and, and you clearly see an increase in the elastic energy storage in the, in the tendon. Um, but uh, it's counterintuitive because you would expect that more force is needed, right, to, to move faster and faster, but there's no clear increase in the VO2. So, so what is, so, so why is it happening? <laughs> yeah. that, that's a really good question. I still ask that question myself too. Um, yes, force goes up, that you can't get more energy, strain energy out of a tendon unless you strain it more and put more, uh, and that's by stressing it or putting more force into it. So if energy cost goes up with generating more force, which is going to, why doesn't the cost go up? Yeah or they don't really increase their um, hopping frequency, so they're not having to recruit and contract their muscles faster. So that's not an, an increased cost, but it would be you would expect the volume of muscle activated to move at a faster speed to go up. So I think that's still a unanswered question in understand, and why, why do horses not achieve the same savings? Because they've got architectures that are even more extreme than kangaroos, and I, so it's not entirely about um, elastic energy savings. I mean, that's a major factor, but I think it's more in terms of how the body moves, um, in terms of center mass mechanics relative to this, this limb spring, and how that interacts with how the muscles are having to generate force. But that's, I, I'd say that's still an open question. Yeah, good one. Hi there, Kirsty McDonald, Vanderbilt University. Thanks for your great presentation. Uh, I was wondering a little bit about tendons. Uh, obviously, they have this role uh, in elastic energy storage in return, uh, so kind of performance, uh, alleviating some muscle demands. But again, they could probably be a buffer for some of uh, the transfer between the muscle and the bone. Uh, I was wondering if you could kind of comment a little bit on that and uh, how you see those two kind of uh, functional roles uh, working together and the timing that they might be occurring at. So could you clarify what, I mean, are you asking about how force, how the tendon functions in relation to the skeleton or yeah, in terms I guess. of transmission of force to the skeleton? Or yeah, so maybe it has a role also in helping us prevent injury uh, in terms of the way it transfers load to bone. Um, well, I think, you know, I think the, um, there are some, some of the, you know, people have been interested in the fact that tendons are viscoelastic. They don't, they're not purely elastic, so they actually dissipate energy to some extent, and that generates heat. Uh, people have been interested in how heat, how much do tendons heat up. I was talking to a couple people earlier today, or yesterday, about some data that showed that tendons, if you cycle them um, um, in vitro, in a, you know, test, do materials testing and do cycling, they'll, they'll rupture and fail over lifetimes of cycle uh, histories that are much shorter than what you expect. And, people running marathons, you might expect to be rupturing tendons at the end of the marathon, they don't. So I think heat dissipation is probably not the problem, but how do tendons ac avoid accumulating um, damage um, relative to repair? I, I think that's an important area. Um, it's clear that um, 
extreme events are what probably rupture tendons and rapid uh, un, you know, motions that um, um, cause the tendon to develop a stress, especially as attachment point is probably the other factor. I mean, we know that from the histology that tendons are uh, integ functionally integrated into the skeleton in terms of the bone, because the, the, the collagen actually gets integrated as sharp fibers into the bone, and so that, that stress transfer before, between the tendon and the bone is actually minimized, so you don't get a stress concentration there. Um, so I would say it's, it's, I don't really, because I don't look at tendon injury per se, and I don't, you know, I've not been in a situation where animals have ruptured tendons unless I've put in the, the buccal transducer is not well designed and it wears on the tendon, and that's not a, not a very good transducer if it's injuring the animal. Um, but, so I don't really have a good answer for you because I think, I mean, I know tendon doesn't repair as rapidly as muscle or bone, um, and so that's one of the concerns is how, how it's loaded over time. So I think uh, avoiding tendon injury, I would say, is just simply doing the proper kind of warm-up exercises and training and being aware that if you've, you've got a sense of pain, that that's probably a sign that you're accumulating damage and to uh, rest and, and stay off while that, uh, until that pain subsides. Thank you. Yep. Um, James Finley, USC. Uh, you briefly showed a video um, from your um, re innervation experiments where you mentioned that there was a loss of, I believe you said, spindle afferents, primarily group ones. Is yep. that correct? Um, a couple of questions. Did you do that unilaterally or bilaterally? So we, we, we when we were, this was work originally was done in cats, and we wanted to see, well, do guinea fowl do the same thing? Well, it turns out people have also shown that it, this re innervation and loss, well, re innervation and regaining motor innervation of the muscle also occurs in rodents because of studies of nerve injury and looking at recovery or how to repair uh, nerve injury. Um, so it's, we, we do a, I didn't mention it, but we do a, 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 a tap, tendon tap to test for the, mm -hmm. the loss of reflex. I would say that there's either diminished reflex or a loss of reflex in all the birds that we did. And we did it bilaterally after we determined that we had the experimental design worked out. So it involved a surgery to transect the nerve, get self re innervation on the left side, and then a subsequent surgery six weeks later after the animal regained motor innervation to do the right side, because we didn't want to make the animal, uh, par you know, so they could actually function and move around uh, in between. And then, then the experiments to actually record from the muscle, which I didn't show you, but we've done those, were done then six weeks, or yeah, six to 12 weeks later after that, after they both muscles had been uh, self re -innervated. Okay, and I guess the bigger, the bigger question is, um, what do those experiments tell you about the role of that specific sensory information well, if, if, so it's basically a, an absence. So if, if we, what we're doing is comparing, and Monica can talk more about this, we, we, we're comparing the way in which the re innervated guinea fowl mus, uh, muscles operate under similar conditions from what we previously recorded from the intact uh, muscle. So it's basically a, a comparison across those uh, earlier experiments with running the same experiments in the same locomotor conditions and seeing how the re innervated muscles behave and so the difference is we then would ascribe to the role of reflexes. Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, or the absence of reflexes. Anthony Hessel, Ruhr University, Volcom. Mm, so you show uh, early on in your, in your studies that um, a little bit of stretch before shortening is really useful to increase force really quickly. And then you talk about wallabies jumping and other animals jumping, and during this time the tendon stretches a lot and stores a lot of energy and it does it, but when I think about it, the, the muscle itself can only bear the force of a tendon increasing if the muscle itself is gonna stretch a little bit. There's some neural, neural stuff there too, but the one, like the, the tight connection between the force uh, rising and the muscle being able to hold it, I, I think shows that the muscle is gonna be stretching a little bit. It does stretch a little bit, but yeah. it doesn't stretch much. <laughs> right, but, but maybe it's misleading to people outside of the comparative community to say things like nearly isometric because they're not really isometric, they stretch a little bit to, to bear the force of the tendons. What right. do you think about well, that? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, well, we, even hi historically, what people called isometric contractions, fixed end contractions, the muscle at the fiber levels probably is not isometric. It shortens against whatever series elasticity there is between the attachment points of the muscle. Uh, even a muscle without a, a tendon will have some intrinsic uh, elasticity that the fibers will show some shortening. So, Purely isometric contractions are actually, you know, probably hardly ever occur. Uh, so whether you don't, you know, I, th I think that wallaby plantaris muscle is about as close to isometric, so I think nearly isometric is a reasonable characterization. But like the gastrocnemius, yes, there's an early phase of shortening, 
but then the length changes once it's pulled against and, and stretched the tendon, it, it's able to, you know, any further stretch of the tendon does, doesn't result in the muscle shortening any further, and it's, it, length change is minimal. Right, okay. Much less. So a 2%, 1 to 3% strain in, in a muscle, I think, is nearly isometric. Uh, compared to a muscle that it shortens by 15% to do work, or in the case of the bird, pectoralis, it's shortening 20 to 35%, so the much more substantial strains in uh, producing work or absorbing energy. No, yeah. but, but still just a little bit of muscle strain is needed to oh, yeah, there's, the there's, force there's, on the right, there's, yeah, the muscle's not purely isometric, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we have to wrap up there. I've got a couple of announcements before you run off, but let's thank Andy again for the fantastic talk. Okay, so there have been a couple of changes today to the sessions. All the